So, um, welcome everyone to another one of our How To Music webinar series. Um, this one is all about producing music, but in your own space, in your home. Um, particularly if you're starting out, you know, you're not going to be able to be going into a studio. Um, so how do you do this? How do you just begin at home? What do you need? You know, what sort of, uh, what sort of ideas do you need to like solidify before you even start recording? Um, we've got three fantastic speakers with us who are going to give their insights from starting from the beginning, right at the basic, all the way to where they are now. Um, and we also have Hazel, who is um, guest hosting with me today as well. Hazel, do you want to just introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Hazel. Um, I've just finished college. So um, I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens really a lot. I know that I want to do something to do with music. Um, I like to spend a fair amount of time just sort of playing around in logic, like, you know, the sound loops that come with it. Um, I just like to sort of arrange them into some kind of song, but I'm kind of trying to move away from that and sort of try and write things for which a band, um, which a band might play, perhaps. So that's kind of what, I'm, what I do at the minute. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so we'll get lots of tips for you here, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so as our guests, we've got Chris Bartholomew, we've got Keisha Thompson, and we've got Grace Savage. Um, Chris, let's start with you. We're going to have a short clip, audio clip of your music, and then um, we'll hear a bit about who you are, what you do, and maybe you can tell us a bit about your song as well. <laughs> Wonderful. I wish that was longer. <laughs> I want to hear more. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm, yeah, I'm Chris Bartholomew. I uh, write a lot of music and uh, often that is for uh, theatre productions or film or various other media. Um, uh, and most often, it's I don't make records. I make music that is played in in live environments. So whether that's theatre productions or live performances, um, the track you just heard is an excerpt from uh, a track that me and a friend uh, Dan Mays, who's a fantastic sax player, um, kind of co-wrote called "In Like a Lion," um, which came out of uh, a free improvisation session we had together we recorded the track uh no we recorded the session um and then spent a day kind of teasing out little ideas from it in my home studio which was less messy than than it is now um and kind of pulling yeah and then uh re-recording certain melodic lines and different ideas and textures uh, and then arranging it into uh, that track, which I don't think I ever actually released. So I should probably get around to doing that at some point. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, cool. So we'll hear, hear from, more from you um, with all the other questions we've got to ask. Um, let's yeah. go to Keisha Thompson. Hello. <laughs> um, we are going to see um, a very short clip of your recent release. Hi.
Thank you so much. That was really cool. I want to I want to see more of that as well. <laughs> I maybe go just watch it on YouTube afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Um hi everyone. Um so yeah, I'm Keisha Thompson, also known as She Be Kiki, which is the name that was on that little teaser, little trailer. Um yeah, and that track is Curse of Eye, Curse of the Eye, and that is the single that is featuring on my new album that's dropping next week. Uh, very exciting. So um, I've got three kind of EPs and I'm probably really struggling to like articulate myself because I'm like, I say that I'm an artist. I have like a spoken word background, a theatre background, but I also do music. And when I do music, that's when I use the name She Be Kiki. Um, but this is probably the first time that I'm really trying to push myself out there as a music artist with this project. Um, so yeah, the whole project is called Ephemera and it started with a collection of poems that I kind of had floating around that I performed and I didn't find that there was, it was enough to make a pamphlet out of, but they still felt very poignant. And because I've got this kind of music um, influence in my work I was like oh it feels like it might be an album actually so that's what I've been working on for the last year with Tom Lear also known as Worker um, and yeah I'm just ready to share it with the world and kind of discuss my process I use a loop pedal quite a lot to make um, but yeah I, pr I presume we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah we want to hear all about that that's exactly the sort of stuff where people will be like what sort of loop pedal do you have? What is it? Tell me the brand. You know, <laughs> how much was it? That sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I have had sneaky peeks of some of the stuff, and yeah, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go to Grey Savage. Hello. So we are going to see um, a longer clip of uh, of. Well, you'll tell us all about it afterwards. So um, let's watch that now.
Fantastic, cool. Um, Grace, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm so bad at Zoom. Uh, my name is Grace Savage and I am a singer, songwriter, beatboxer, loop station artist. And that clip I think is maybe five years old now, hence the dark hair and much skinnier version of me. Um, and the story of that is I was actually just going through a quite a big breakup and I was obsessively listening to Banks' um, first album, Goddess. I literally listened to it probably about twice a day for about six months. And so I, was, I loved Waiting Game, which is the cover in, that I do of, of her song. And I was walking around the park and I was singing that song and the original was really like, ah. <laughs> it's a really like driving slow kick drum but I was just singing it and I started doing like a little drum and bass beatbox along to it and I thought oh my god that would be a sick drum and bass remix so I immediately went home feeling really inspired and just like made a drum and bass version of the bank song that I loved um and then I tweeted it once I'd got it made to loads of people and was like oi look at my video uh, and it worked. Jamal Edwards of SBTV was like, yeah, this is good. I'll put it on SBTV. So there you go. If you pester people enough, awesome. sometimes it works. <laughs> um, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and your background and sort of like what, what you do? Yeah. So, uh, I initially went to Leeds university to study theater, wanted to be an actress. Um, but I'd been beatboxing privately since I was about 15 or 16 um, and started when I was at uni doing open mic nights and stuff like five minute slots around Leeds. Um, and I ended up getting a gig in a children's theater show as a beatboxer at the South Bank while I was still at uni. So I was getting paid to beatbox and I was like, hang on a minute, maybe I don't want to do this whole drama school thing and be an actress. Maybe there's something in this beatboxing and much less people were doing it. This is like 10 years ago now. Um, so I decided to pursue it as a career and I was a full-time beatboxer within like two or three years of being self-employed and on the doll and having no money. Um, and then slowly more and more jobs came in. I started teaching beatboxing. Then I started introducing singing and songwriting probably when I was about 23, 24. Uh, so about only about six years ago and I've released three EPs since 2017. Um, no, four, four EPs independently. Um, so yeah, and I use a loop station mainly when I perform live. Um, Chris, he's down here for me, is also in my band and um, produces some of my stuff. We've worked together a lot. Um, yeah, it's fun being a beatboxer because I get to work with tap dancers, clog dancers, poets, um, Morris dancers. I've done that in the past. Um, it's a very sort of versatile art form. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things I've, I have tried and it's embarrassing. So <laughs> I, this is a lot of appreciation for what you do there. Uh, yeah. It takes a lot of practice as yeah. does anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is everyone that we have speaking. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. Uh, it's really appreciated by everybody. Um, let's start with our first question, which goes out to everyone. Um, when did you start creating your own music and what equipment did you have to start off with, if any? Cool, yeah, great. I'll go first. Um, I probably wouldn't, I'm not comfortable enough to call myself a producer yet, but maybe one day I will. But talking about um, Apple Loops, I know Hazel, you mentioned that um, earlier when we were doing our introductions that you work in Apple Loops in Logic. That's exactly how I started out. Um, and I think it was around 2016, so about four years ago, I just used to get Apple loops and drag them over and then I'd like top line and sing over the top, maybe add some beatboxing. Um, and that is actually how I created or began the very first single that I put out called Medusa, which is now my most streamed song ever. And that all started from an Apple loop. So I wouldn't be, tell anyone to be ashamed of like using Apple loops because there can be some really cool creative stuff um, from, from using them. 
So what I did was had this bass line and then I gave it to Chris eventually and was like, Chris, can you make this sound better? <laughs> um, and it turned out to be a real collaboration between us. And I love that way of working. I love getting something to a certain point being like, I think this is as much as grace as I can put in here. Like I, I can't really go as far as mixing and really, really getting it to a really professional point, but I can get it far enough that I have my own sort of sonic stomp, which can be quite empowering. Um, to, to, to do that basically and then I like to pass it on to a proper producer uh, and it feels like a real collaborative process so that's often how I work quite a lot um, and equipment wise it used to be just me and a microphone I remember the days when I used to turn up with just a microphone it was amazing didn't have to lug anything around I'd just be like right and I'd do a 20 minute beatbox set um, but I think as creatives we all tend to get a bit like all right, what's next? What's next? Like I need to move on to something else. So that for me became, I want to start, I want to start singing. And I always hid behind the beatboxing. I was like, well, this is my party trick. You know, like I can beatbox and I sort of know that'll impress people. And I got to a stage where I was so comfortable with the beatboxing. I was like, I really want to challenge myself. And I knew that singing would be a huge challenge. Um, so that's something I sort of forced myself to overcome by getting a loop station uh, where you can, I could put my beats down and I could sing over the top. And I found like singing so much more exposing and vulnerable and difficult, um, which I know a lot of beatboxers have said they want to sing more, but they're, they're worried about that. So getting a loop station is a really sort of fun way to, to overcome that and experiment. And then ever so slowly, I put my I put my loop station on an ironing board on a keyboard stand, but I've had to go from a mini ironing board to a full blown ironing board now <laughs> because I keep <laughs> buying like extra little bits to go with it. Um, what, what have I got? I had like an Akai, I think it's an MPX 16. So I could start triggering in oh, yeah. samples into my loop station. I play, play a bass line on that, put it into my loop station, beatbox over the top, then sing over the top and start introducing like using the stems from my tracks and stuff like that. So it went from like pure vocal stuff, which you saw in that Banks cover I did, that was all just vocals to actually having more meaty production. So I feel like the beatboxing stuff's really cool, but sometimes it doesn't have the same punch as like a proper drum kit or proper electronic drum pads. Um, and I just wanted to beef out the sound in that way a bit more. Um, and just this year I bought myself an MPC um, because I love pressing buttons. <laughs> I you find like explain what an MPC is just for anyone who's like, what? <laughs> it's right here, let me show it to you. <laughs> Um, so this is like standalone piece of hardware. So you basically, it does what logic does, but, um, it's a big old toy rather than it being in your laptop. You've got all these buttons that you can press and you can create a track from start to finish. You can mix it, master it, um, and you can put it in song mode and then you can perform live with it as well. Um, it's really you have to be very patient. I'm on an MPC course at the moment and I'm slowly learning. But the wonderful thing about the internet, there's always some geek out there who has just <laughs> learned how to do something. There's this guy called Matthew Stratton who has done an MPC one course already and the thing's only been out for like three months. So I paid 20 quid. And if I have any questions about it, I just message him and he replies straight away. <clears throat> so even though it's quite daunting, I feel quite supported in my learning of this piece of equipment. And then I can hook it up to my loop station and just means I have more buttons on my ironing board. Yeah, that's like, I think that's something that people don't quite maybe realize that um, when you get a piece of equipment, whatever it is, um, it can be really hard to try and go through that manual and figure out what it means. Like, how do I use this? So absolutely, there are YouTube videos. There are people who, um, I mean, you can pay, but also there's loads of YouTube videos that are probably giving you great advice for free as well. So, you know, make sure you sort of like really explore all the things you can do with these very odd little pieces of equipment that are just, you know, <laughs> mind boggling to begin with. <laughs> yeah, but you have patience is the one thing I've learned with technology, which I always resisted in the beginning. I don't want to be a producer. It's so fiddly annoying. Something always goes wrong. Like you spend ages problem solving, which I found really frustrating. But then I learned when you stick with something and you overcome that problem solving, it feels really great. And you sort of get addicted to that, which I never thought I'd say, but <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, what about from a 
someone else like how did you start what equipment did you have is it a similar sort of story or very different yeah I'll jump in yeah cool um yeah I've had a similar kind of journey to Grace actually um so I come from a background of singing in like gospel choirs and soul choirs and also I used to do a lot of like African drumming and Indian music so I was used to being a bit more percussive I'd say um I dabbled a little bit with piano and guitar when I was growing up but I never like properly trained I just didn't want to I think I was similar to Grace again in that I found I was so impatient I was like I already know what I want it to sound like and I'm not there yet someone else just do it yeah. um, <laughs> I'd just do that um so yeah I found myself I'm lucky that I'm based in Manchester and I've got loads of cultural centers around me so I've always been around a lot of musicians producers beatboxers as well so I've collaborated with a lot of people picked up little skills here and there but never fully had the need to learn how to do full like production so again I'd sit next to people making electronic beats and stuff like that but I wouldn't learn how to do it Mm. um but what I would do was I found myself veering towards using a loop pedal because I was like oh I can just get a sound down I can just get something down so that I can then communicate to people and go oh I want it to sound like this or I can play around with the effects but it's all really really quick and again because I'm more interested in like harmonies and how I can use my poetry and merge things in that way I just found like that piece of those pieces of equipment did what I wanted um but I was very much open to the idea of like I'm gonna have to go and communicate this to someone who's gonna make it sound better (laughs) make it sound um decent (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah so I found the loop pedal really empowering I started off with just the little ones like the Boss RC3 just tiny ones that just it's just one pedal and then I went to um the 30 or was it the 30 you know the 300 where it's like three three pedals and now I've got the one that was in Grace's video as well which is the 505 which I love um and that's what I used for my last did you say boss yeah the boss rc505 um and that's one I used my last project with Tom actually so I'd create something on that and then send it over to him or he'd send a track to me and I'd load it onto the pedal, remake it or do something over it and then send that back and we'd just kind of go in that way. Um, interestingly, when lockdown happened, I had to get my head around Logic and just dive in. Um, I dabbled on it a little bit and on, on, on Audacity, but I was just like, oh, please don't make me. But I had to mm-hmm. do it. And it was good actually learning how to do that. And because I've got a fair bit of background, I've, I've got some of the equipment that I need already so I already had like a sound card and mics and stuff so I was like I can do this like I can set this up it's just being patient <laughs> um but I've invested in an Akai mini keyboard now uh, I think it's an MPK something something some numbers mini uh, what was it Akai yeah. MPK 249 yeah because I have wanted to go back to doing theory for a while because I feel like I can only go so far now and I can I can feel the impatience of of wanting to create something myself actually and, and wanting to feel a bit more empowered and with that keyboard you can link it up to logic and start to program things in and mix like you know yeah digital electronic and all that kind of stuff and I feel like I've got the headspace for that now so that's the direction that I'm going in um but yeah, really, I like to stay quite mm, percussive. Is that the right word? I suppose. Yeah, I've just got I've got like loads of little weird instruments and things in my room, and things that are just not even instruments that I'm like, oh, that makes an interesting sound, and I just record it on a mic and just see what I can do with it. But that's literally what my process is, and I beatbox a little bit, but I know that I'm not a proper beatboxer. But again, I just do it because I'm like, this is the kind of beat pattern, like drum pattern that I want. And as I long as I can yeah. communicate, I know that someone else can reimagine it and just make it sound better. Yeah, I think that's like a really good point, isn't it? That, you know, for a lot of people who feel like, well, I can't play the instrument. So how am I supposed to get across 
what I want that instrument to do, you can try and vocalize it or try and create it in some other way without actually having to be, you know, that instrumentalist. You know, there are ways of getting that idea across, like beatboxing or, or singing the melody or, you know, tapping it out. <laughs> and then Chris, what about you? Um, my, so both my parents are classical musicians and I got dragged along. Oh, uh, uh, acting going on there. Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, got dragged along to amateur classical concerts like quite a lot and they were really bad um and then pops up on my tv uh these two young ch kids tv presenters called dick and dom and they had this program where they uh every week they had to do and learn to be a new thing it was a week where they had to learn to be a garage dj and mc and i saw that and that was um just the the catalyst that i needed to be like okay electronic music is is what i want to do but what i really want to do is do that in live spaces i i really like being in front of a crowd and everything being semi-improvised and having a table full of bits and bobs and making something exciting in the moment um i really struggle if i'm honest to to sit in a studio on my own and compose large reams of stuff unless it's for something cool yeah so yeah for me, for me it was it was those uh those set of decks and the four drum and bass vinyl my brother got me and then from there it was okay what music software can i pick up for cheap off ebay yeah. um and I think I've at this point used most of them in some respect, um, but yeah, I've kind of I've kind of settled down a bit now. Okay, so this is another question for everyone. Um, <clears throat> so and this is like, how do you mix the music yourselves? You do it yourselves, or you get other people to do it? <laughs> I'm going to say maybe that's a question for Chris, <laughs> not assuming anything about anyone else. Um, I'll jump in on that. I mean, I, I always think about splitting the, the process of like going from, let's say you've written a song on an acoustic guitar and singing, and you want to go from that to something that could get played on radio one there's a whole load of stages that that has to go through goes through you record it you maybe do some production work adding some other instruments and sounds and textures uh and then you mix it and then it gets mastered and then it goes off um in an ideal world all those jobs would be being done by separate people um so you have your mix engineer who is the like uh i'm trying to think some examples of mix engineers uh, there are loads there are so many and uh their job is to take all of the tracks of the song and adjust them with volume and with eq and different uh effects to make sure that they are serving the song properly so when that trumpet comes in at the beginning of verse two is it overpowering the vocal okay yes it is so i need to make sure that it's sitting underneath what's going on um is the impact of the final chorus beefy enough no it isn't so i need to make sure that's really hitting um so mixing is like a lot of things in musical music production is a mixture of the technical and the creative um there is really boring stuff like just knowing you know listening to a snare sound and going that's not doing what i want it to do so i'm going to adjust it in a myriad of different ways but there's also or i think often more importantly what what is the song trying to do at any particular moment and making sure that 
the balance of the arrangement is serving that purpose um because if it if it isn't then you've got some problems <laughs> so like mixing the, the... is something that that you should you, you know you should do if you're intending to like release a song even if it's a um self-release um for for it to be taken seriously as a production you would suggest mixing is is pretty important then <laughs> Ab absolutely um and i would say uh mixing is something which can be a bit expensive to ask other people to do um where the uh the my like main suggestion is is the mastering end um and essentially mastering is making sure that when your record gets played next to another record on the radio or in a club or you know alongside other music that it's kind of that it feels at roughly all of the same uh levels then that is the time to to find a mastering engineer and send it off because they are uh magicians but they're also a great source of feedback for your mixes so um anytime i've had things mastered i'll say to the mastering engineer you know okay what wasn't working in my mix what did you have to correct for and they'll generally come back and say ah in the kind of the the base end was a bit muddy it wasn't clear enough or i just wanted to add a bit more sparkle right at the top or all of those things that's kind of that's kind of really important and to be honest to get a track mastered is usually between 30 and 100 pounds and if if there is any viable way of doing that then i would 100 percent recommend it cool so well is there anyone else that wants to speak for that one or we'll move along I was just going to add um, that I think even though I'm not someone who mixes, I've had producers who are very encouraging and have asked me to like be in the space and like you were saying, Chris, know what's what's going on and be aware of what they have to do to get my music to that standard. I think it's good to be able to, even if you know that you're not technically minded or you don't know how to do those things, to know the language and to know the process so that then you can communicate better moving forward or know that you're making your music with a certain intention or it has to go to a certain person with a certain process is really good to have that kind of that knowledge um and also what's been really nice is i've been encouraged on this project that i'm releasing and on the last one that i did to record a kind of a, a live loop um, which has been really nerve-wracking for me because I'm like, oh my god, I'm completely in control. Like I'm controlling all the levels, and we'll do my mic like extend. I'll have like two mics, so I'll have the mic for my main vocal, and then the mic that's going through the loop pedal in case I want to do any layers or effects and things like that. Um, but as soon as they press record, it's all on me, and I have to just make sure that I'm bringing in all the different layers and things at the right time because once that's started, they don't have any control to mix it. They can only mix the whole thing, um, the the music that's coming out of the loop and then my vocal, but they can't like separate out the different layers. And that's something I have done on this last project. There is a song where the sounds are from my loop pedal, but we actually took them off individually, individual layers and then laid them down. And um, so that's another way of doing it. But yeah, it's just good to be aware of what the process is, what the person is that has to work on your music like what they have to do, even if you don't do it. Okay. Do you wanna say anything, Chris? Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but my one thing I learned about mixing is that when you're EQing things, it's really useful to take out the bass and lots of things. So it stops it getting too muddy and it allows the actual bass that you've created to come through. You're absolutely nodding. yeah completely that's um, my top tip <laughs> any any sound that you don't think of as bass 
um f- get yourself a, a high pass filter that's a uh, an audio filter that only lets things through above a certain frequency and slap that on um because believe me those that those low frequencies are are tricksy they're really tricksy and uh, the less yeah. the less things you have going on down there the easier your life is gonna be yeah that's one thing some i just i had a track and I had loads of different layers and i was like why does it sound like this and like oh and they, i saw them go through every single channel in logic and they just eq'd out <laughs> all the bass i was like oh it's as simple as that it's just a good and also everything was really loud that's one thing i've learned whenever i sent anyone a track it was you know when it go it peaks in the red in logic and it says like goes five decibels over whatever I, I learned that because I wanted it to sound fat. I was just turning everything up and doing everything really loud. But actually, you can't make enough space to hear the intricacies of what you're creating then. So just trust that trust that it will sound good, even if you do it quietly. And then the mixing and mastering engineers can work their magic. So, yeah, that's all I know about mixing, I mean, really. The, uh, the hel- oh, not hilarious, but the, the thing that always surprised me when I've I've done bits of mixing and production with Grace is the amount of bass that is in your beatboxing hi-hat sound <laughs> is is like you would never think it was there and then you put headphones on it's like oh that is a that is a rumbly hi-hat rumbly. I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> okay so is there anything else we want to say or are we ready to move on Okay. Uh, so, what programs do people uh, is everyone use, and do you have to spend a lot on equipment and software? I think. I mean, I just use Logic. I use my Loop Station, and I often transfer the audio from my Loop Station into Logic and arrange that way, or I use my MPC. But I don't spend loads of money on plugins and things like that, and I actually think. Maybe some people think buying all this fancy stuff will make them a better producer or a better creative person. It's absolutely not true. It's all to do with how creative you can be with how little you've got. Um, and I think it's a trap. And once you've bought one bit of equipment, then you go on to check your emails and the bloody cookies and algorithms and then trying to sell you every other bit of equipment. And you go, oh, maybe I do need that second or fifth SM58 microphone. And you, and you just end up spending so much money. But I think start if you start learning on something quite basic and if you can make something sound really good on something cheap then you're really working your creative juices i think it's it's a bit of a trap in electronic and, um, music and like i think i use logic i i like logic i wouldn't know how to use anything else but if somebody's not on um a mac has anyone got any programs that are useful for anyone who's not using a mac Um, I, I, <laughs> um, I used to use Windows and um, I didn't, I wasn't like as, I didn't do as much shit on there, like all editing wise. It was literally loop based and you knew not, absolutely nothing about mixing. It wasn't like a thing that's obvious to that software, but I used to use um, this software called Magix. Um, but I'm not sure if that's changed since the 2013 version <laughs> so, Chris, yeah. have you heard of it have you heard of magics um very in the mists of time i think on on windows uh a r- really good place to start these days is uh it, i mean it used to be called fruity loops it's now called fl studio um and it's, it's one of those bits of software which has been looked down upon for many years and some of my favorite records and some of my favorite producers in the world still use fruity loops fl studio as it's known um and make some incredible music with it um so yeah i think if you're going windows from a starting point fl studio is not a bad place to start if you are starting from literally nothing i would say uh, a second-hand iPad with GarageBand on it is an insanely good place to start. Um, it's 
really annoyingly good garage band and i only say that because like it keeps on catching up to logic um and obviously like logic's a couple of hundred quid um but garage band is again some brilliant records have been made just with garage band um I know Grimes started out just making on Garage Band and a few other people, and there's so much you can do with that, and just by pushing the limitations of of it, um, and then you don't need a mic because you've got the microphone built into the iPad, and yeah, it's not going to sound the best in the world, but it's something you can express with really quickly. Yeah, cool. I I think you're right. Actually, I've I've had a play on Garage Band and like, it it does create what you know. It's actually quite intuitive as well. You can you can get on with it quite quite quickly, even if you're not really yeah. sure how to use it, which is great. Um, I'm gonna shove two questions together unless Keisha's got something she wants to add. I was just gonna add really quickly. I think there's no harm. Just thinking from an access point of view, and again, like we were saying, you know, you want to start small, start with something that's cheap or secondhand. But also just ask friends, just be a bit cheeky because I've got friends who, you know, they've bought equipment or they've bought instruments and they're not using it. It's their collecting dust and they've not bothered, you know, getting into it. And if and if they're up for it, you can just come around and like play around on it. Or like I've lent my loop pedal out to friends because I've got like four now and I don't use some of them. So I'm like, yeah, just yeah, you can borrow that one. And they then play around with it and they're like oh okay I will invest in this now because I've tried it out because sometimes it's such a barrier to be like oh my god am I gonna pay for this and I, will I even use it and all that kind of stuff and it can feel like a big investment but you just need to feel like it's worthwhile and that you know that you'll use it so just sometimes just ask around see if there's anyone who will let you just come into their space and just play around on their on their equipment absolutely I definitely agree with that I'm borrowing my um flatmate's guitar at the minute and effects pedal and I don't intend to give it back <laughs> um, which is hard because we one, live together um <laughs> one final thing on like the the low cost options for stuff I have to give a massive shout out to a company called Spitfire Audio who um uh made the name for themselves by producing like amazingly good and stupidly expensive orchestral sample libraries but now have a whole range of of amazing free instruments um and they've even done a collaboration with the bbc symphony orchestra where you get a whole orchestral sound pack uh for uh i mean they have it listed on their website for 50 pounds if you can't afford that you can email them and they will send you a copy and uh yeah i just wanted to sort of tip the hat a little bit to, to the work that they've been doing because um their free their free things are amazingly good absolutely we'll um maybe pop that into the mixcloud chat do you want to just say it again for anybody yeah it's spitfire audio um and their free stuff is called labs um and what i am going to do is uh, I'm going to put a link to that in our Zoom chat and maybe Jess would be kind enough to uh, to copy it over. Wonderful. Cool. I'll be looking at that too, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to get into more questions because we are horribly running out of time so quick. I don't understand how, how it goes so far. So um, I'm going to squeeze two questions together. And the first one is sort of like, how long does it take you to write and produce or, or just write, you know, whatever it is that you're doing? How long does it take you to write a song or a track? And then in terms of like doing that, are you collaborating with people or is it something that you like to do on your own first and then take it? I know, Grace, you sort of touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, oh, yeah, I keep thinking I've muted myself. Um... It really depends. Uh, like, for example, this week I'm working on a, a beatbox album to uh, pitch for sync for TV and film. So I won't release it as as under my name, Grace Savage, <clears throat> but I'll give it to a company for, for, to add to their library. And I did five tracks in 
two days basically and then i'm going to send them off to a producer to sort of put them together a bit but that was literally just me going right what's drum and bass and me going on one channel and then on the next string and then on the next bit and i'm like that sounds good and then i put it all into logic and i arrange it like to make a little two minute piece and i i did yeah like two or three songs in a day that's me working really really fast but for the songs that i release sometimes i'll be sitting on a track for three years before it goes out because i want it to be perfect but it will start as one version like maybe it'll have piano in it and then i'll go and i've changed my mind now i want it to be you know hardcore whatever but then that will change and then okay okay maybe we need to get someone else on board to work on this the beats or whatever or it's not quite right to release that at this time because I'm, i'm not feeling that that's my sonic sound at the moment so yeah some some tracks can literally I think one of them didn't come out I started went to the studio with someone to write it and it came out maybe two or three years later um just because it things just take a long time especially when you haven't got loads of money you can't just chuck money at stuff and be like I'll pay for this this and that you have to do a lot of favors like oh would you mind producing this if I do this for you and blah 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 um but generally going into the studio with a producer we can get a decent chunk of a song down in a day um yeah depends depends how you're vibing and do you find that like um you know say if you were going to like include somebody in so like as a collaboration whether that's in your own space or if you're going to their space do you feel do you find it useful to have your ideas ready or do you like to just go in with nothing and just see what happens that's for everybody as well not just grace (laughs) yeah i like to go in with an idea so i'm just going to say that very quickly just makes me feel better about myself to come with something because it takes the pressure off the other person as well like you're not just going go on then let's get something started you're like no I've got ideas and I'm passionate and here it is let's go so I think it's always good to have ideas and yeah what about- I was gonna say sorry um okay. <laughs> yeah I'm the same it varies um I've sat in one session and done like three four songs on the pedal um just because I felt super super inspired and I've looked at the time and been like oh okay it's four in the morning <laughs> yeah and then other times you've got an idea and you're just like oh, 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 oh and it's just not coming but you know that it's bubbling I'm like oh it's all right I'm just fermenting it's fine it's fine <laughs> um but when I get into that space if I feel like I've still got energy and I want to do something I'll just pick a song that I like and I'm like I just cover it I'm just like oh what let me think of a song that that I know and I'll try and think of something that's not necessarily obvious it's not really necessarily linked to what I'm trying to do but it might have an element that makes me think in a different way um and I'll just try and reimagine the song and pick a certain element of the song maybe and then just use that um just use a certain harmony or a certain hook or yeah or a sound even and then just play on that and then just see if that then leads me back to where I'm trying to trying to go. So I just kind of give myself these kind of provocations. But yeah, I'm the same as Grace as that. I don't feel comfortable going in to collaborate with nothing. Like that just makes me feel, well, no, I don't like it. <laughs> I like to know that I'm turning up and they've got something that they want me to do. I'm happy to just be in the space and hear someone making something and then be like, oh, okay. Oh, can I jump on that or whatever? but something has to already be happening. Um, and I'll usually have like, my phone has got a million notes in it. So I'll always have like a book on me or a phone or something where I'm like this line or that hook or whatever. And I'll, I'll always have things that I can bring in, but yeah. I don't think I've ever just gone in completely cold and with nothing to, to play with. That makes me feel like deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> Maybe that's a fear we both need to face. We should just get the studio together with nothing prepared and deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, what about you? Um, I, if I'm working with someone or I'm writing something for somebody else, like for a theatre show or a film or something, um, I write really fast. Like, I can get things done really quickly. Uh when i am writing for myself it takes me years Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean the 
I think the last EP that I released, and I released that last year, was sat on my computer not being released for three and a half years. And I think I I made all of those tracks on a not particularly fun work trip to uh, Norway. And uh, I was really angry at that time. And so the music has got this like crippling anger in it. And and I just never, I didn't feel like I could release that for a long time. And now, so I might make things quite fast and then just sit on them for a really long time. And then they'll come out. Almost once I've stopped caring about them, then I can release them. That's um, That actually is perfect because it relates to our next question that Hazel's going to ask. Um, how is it? How does it feel to release your own music like out there? Do you find it quite daunting? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh. No, you go for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think my answer to this is bigger than music. And again, I feel the most exposed when I'm singing. I don't know why. Um, Because I make theatre, I write, um, I do loads of different types of art forms. But yeah, I feel the most exposed when I'm when I'm singing and I'm releasing music. But you've just got to do it. Like you're never going to feel. What I've learned now is you're always going to feel uncomfortable. Um, and that's kind of part of it in that it just shows that you care. Like I worry if I didn't feel uncomfortable because then I'm like I'm not really bothered about this. I don't really want to share it. And I'm not attached to this. That's weird. So that's worse for me. So I just kind of give my discomfort a hug, and I just bring it in. And I'm like, it's part of the process. It's fine. Um, and I just ask myself questions. I'm like, do I sound like myself? Because I'm super critical. So when I'm listening to something, I can just hear the mistakes and I'm like, oh my God, why did I let that happen? Or what, what is that? Or whatever. But sometimes I'm like, no, because when I listen to someone else's work and I hear those little moments, I enjoy them, actually. When something's not perfect, I enjoy it. So I'm hoping that my listeners will have that same level of generosity and just appreciate the authenticity of what I've put out. But it will never... You know, I've met novelists who, when they're reading, you see that they've scratched out pages of their books. They're never, you're never done. Like you're always editing. It's always changing. But just respect that it's come to a certain point and it sounds how it sounds at that time and it's ready to be shared. Um, yeah, so that's just what I tell myself. <laughs> I think I was reading like a really cheap version of Prince's biography that I found in a charity shop for two quid. And in there, they said that Prince had written enough songs to release an album every month for the next 40 years or something ridiculous. I mean, my release radar, Prince has a new single out every single week. And I'm like, how? <laughs> but I read that and I was like, do you know what? And I'd only had two EPs out by this point, And I was like, God, I've worked really hard on those six songs. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, for God's sake, no one works as hard as Prince, but you need to just not be so precious about things because actually no one really cares as much as you do they'll listen to your song and be like this is great and they'll move on to their ham sandwich that they're eating like I don't know artists were so stuck in our head because it's so important to us but actually just constantly putting stuff out there is is really good but also don't feel the pressure to because I know there's this whole thing about having to have constant engagement and having to satisfy the Spotify algorithms and you must be releasing every month if you want to be successful I think, no, you should take your time. If you want to release once every three years, you totally do that. But don't not release because you're scared of what people will think. Um, but it's easier said than done. Like we're artists and we all, we're doing a brave thing by putting ourselves out there like and being open to critique constantly. Um, so it is scary, but that's why it's important to talk to other artists as well and build build communities around that kind of stuff. I, I sort of feel like I, because the music that I, I tend to release is doesn't have vocals and I don't sing on it, then I, I don't necessarily feel that sense of uh, like vulnerability with it. What is really interesting is that there's always like ideas and there's always an emotional and conceptual like 
underpinning to what I'm releasing. And it's always hard for me to know how much of that to let the audience know about. Um, and yeah, that's something I, I still struggle with. It's like, okay, I do fairly abstract electronic music, yet it does mean things, but should I be telling the audience that? But because there's that level of abstraction, I don't, I feel very in control of how much I'm letting the audience in at any one time. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's there, there are very different ways to connect, isn't it? And particularly if you can hear a voice, you know, like it's the, it's the same way of people um, seeing a face in everything, you know, they look at the clouds and they see a face. It's the same with, with voice. You, you hear a sound and if it, even if it sounds slightly like a voice, there, there's a different connection there. But you can still get all those different like emotions and and uh, connections with music, whether it's instrumental or vocal. It's it can still be just as daunting to release as well, can't it? <laughs> um, so I'm going to combine two questions again, uh, and this one: um, How do you keep yourself productive, particularly if we're thinking about lockdown and the fact that everyone's like, "Oh, we've all got all this time now. Let's be super creative." How have you guys found that? Have you been producing? Um, or writing and in that same vein where is your inspiration from you know what is it that inspires you go on Chris um the short answer is no um <laughs> to be like brutally honest and I have really struggled to write any music during lockdown um I think Partly that's because even though I do a lot of writing music on my own, I write music with and for people. And the just the like sense of isolation was just stopped me wanting to try and communicate in that way. Um, I'm just in the process of finishing off my master's at the moment and uh uh, master's degree rather than master's record whatever um and i'm planning this 45 minute performance and this is how committed i am to not writing any music at the moment it is entirely improvised and so i'm doing so much preparation around that project and it's with uh six musicians who i think are f fantastic and an amazing lighting designer and there is not one pre-written note in that 45 minute performance this is how much i do not want to write music at the moment <laughs> i'd say i've probably been on the other side of the spectrum in that um i was lucky that i had this project so i knew that i needed to finish it off so that was my main focus in pushing this release um, so I felt quite blessed in that I've had something that I've been able to maintain focus on. Um, but yeah, I've stayed quite busy. I still, luckily the fit that I work with, I've not been furloughed. So I've actually been working on a show, a digital show, and I've got writing commissions. Um, but in between that, I started to, yeah, like I said, I bought that new piece of equipment. I um, attended loads of workshops, actually. Somerset House were doing loads of really interesting sound workshops, like soundscaping and, and yeah, like coding, using music, using coding. And I was just like, oh, this is cool. So I've just been like, just checking stuff out, really, and playing around with stuff, but with no pressure. I think that's what I've really enjoyed. If, like, I had loads of my gigs taken away. But I just reached back out to people, turned them into like other opportunities and workshops and stuff. And then some of the artists that I was going to collaborate with anyway, I've just been like, oh, should we just do something anyway? Um, so an artist that I was going to, we were, I've got a series of Venn diagram poems and we were going to make some looped musical representations of them and kind of go down a bit of a geeky maths route. Um, but now I've just said to her, let's work on a different body of work that I've got. I've got some poems that are all based on um, films. I do an event. There's an event in Manchester called Film Night that's really fun, but we take a film and then reinterpret it as an artist. Um, so I've got all these poems that have got film references. So I was like, oh, I want to just do like some soundscaping maybe and look at the soundtracks that are attached to these films and merge my poetry with that and, and whatever. So I feel like I've really enjoyed 
having the space of not having to do so many commissions and gigs and being lucky I really appreciate that I'm in a financially stable situation where I've had space to just kind of be in my room and make stuff just for no reason um and for my own well-being and my own enjoyment and not having that pressure of having to share it um so yeah I've been quite creative which I'm grateful for And what about you, Grace? Uh, yeah, I've been pretty busy. I mean, lockdown happened. Um, my EP was 12 months in the making and then I was ready to release it in April. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was too late then. And it was just the worst time to be promoting an EP, but I just went full on. I was like, fine, if this is what I've, this is the ha cards I've been dealt, I'm gonna go for it. So I was in full on promotional mode for the beginning of lockdown, which meant I was sort of in denial that it was, we were even in a pandemic. I was like, cause I'm just doing my EP. And when I finished the EP, I was like, oh my God, I've got loads of free time and all my jobs have been canceled. And now I feel really anxious and scared. Um, but then I just sort of, my way of dealing with it is to like, just dive into more work. Um, so luckily I got a commission from the BBC to make a short film in my flat with my partner who I live with, um, which you can now watch on iPlayer. Um, so I wrote all the music for that, which is something I'm really proud of because I was just, if I was to see that listing come up, I don't know, on the Arts Council website, like we're looking for a composer for a BBC short film, I'd skip right past that. I'd be like, well, I can't do that. But because I'd applied for it as like a beatboxer, uh, and my partner who's an actor and writer and director, um, I sort of was forced into doing it um and yeah that was like my focus for like three months i was i was learning how to that's how i learned how to use the npc really was was through that project so yeah just creating a routine for myself and going head first into into stuff without having much time to think has been pretty good but also i totally get it if you're not feeling creative because it's really really difficult and not everyone is like you said in a great financial situation to be able to have the luxury to be able to create. So I feel really, really grateful to be an artist getting some sort of income right now. Absolutely. Um, we are going to pop the link to that short film um, into the Mixcloud chat. So anyone can just grab on that. <laughs> cool. Um, so we are actually running out of time, uh, which is a shame because I feel like we could probably chat for another whole hour about, you know, music production, but also just being creative um, within your own space and how you collaborate with people. I feel like there's so much information here. Um, so what I thought for the next like two minutes before we like say goodbye, can you guys just go around and tell us like maybe one or two pieces of equipment that you would recommend to somebody who is just starting out, um, what you think they need, um, or if, you know, even if it's like, really basic thing of like a phone you know what do you think that person who's like i don't know where to start what should i go for i'd say if there's any singer songwriters out there there's an app called voice memos um which is where if you get any ideas or melodies that pop into your head it's a really great quality sound quality uh where you can just put your let me see if i can get the app up to show you i know we haven't got much time and i'm probably wasting it by doing this but it's a decent little app. There it is. Music memos. It's not called voice memos. It's called music memos. So you record your thing there. And then when you go to click on it, you can like add drums. It gives you like the notes of the, the key, like the notes that you're singing in. And you can send that in an email to someone straight away. So and it's that, called music memos. Music memos. It's a really good note for jotting down quick melody ideas. Cool. Chris, what have you got? Um, I, the thing that makes me happiest to make music on is an iPad mini. And, um, I am the person who anytime a new music app gets released, if it's under a fiver, which most of them are, I'll buy it usually without thinking. And, <laughs> um, I like for, I love my studio. I love it so much, but uh, often I just, if I'm sat on a train or uh, on a bus, 
and I want to start experimenting with sound, then then the iPad has just been an absolute gold mine of ideas and something that I could spend happily just spend hours and hours in. And Keisha. Yeah, I think if I think about the first things that I bought when I was like, right, okay, I want to do this. It was literally just like I said before, an RC3, Boss RC3, one pedal, some decent headphones and a good mic. Just get a really good mic. Make sure you've got some decent cables. And what was your mic? Them. It was an SM58. Classic, cool. Yeah, standard. And then after that, I just looked into like mics that are better for like, because my vocals, I'm quite like, I'm quite a lot soft and high pitched singer. So I was looking into stuff that was better in that way. And I've got like a better condenser mic and all that kind of stuff. But to start off with, just get an SM58. Um, they're pretty hard going as well. You can drop them and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty resilient um and yeah just headphones as well because you want to be able to hear what you're doing really intimately and sometimes you want some privacy or whatever it depends what space you might be in you might not always have um access to a studio or whatever but if you can just give yourself room to be kind of intimate and 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 just get on with it then yeah i'd say they're the three things that i would go for cool perfect um so that is us basically coming to an end um, thanks everyone who's been watching and thank you speakers for joining us. Uh, there's been a wealth of information there. I'm, I've learned loads actually. <laughs> um, and H Hazel, I hope you've, you know, got loads of information for your own productions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it's been quite nice doing this webinar with, with you guys because I've actually I've been making like my own stuff through like the sound loops and logic and um, I don't know many other people that use sound, lo sound loops like that so I found it, I found it uh, quite daunting to start like showing people things like I've only just become comfortable with showing my own stuff with people who aren't just close friends so it's just meant a lot to be able to do this because it, it's just kind of Maybe like, maybe want to take it a bit further. Yeah, <laughs> have put it. Absolutely, it makes you want to just start creating more music now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give a little um, bit of information for anyone watching about our next webinar, which is going to be in uh, two weeks' time, I think. But I'll double check that. The dates will go up on our um, website and onto our Facebook pages. And it's going to be all about writing songs. It's a step by step of how to write your first song. So if you want to write, but you have no idea how to start, the next web webinar is the one to watch. And thank you so much for joining. If you want to know more about what's going on, go to bluejamarts.org or you can follow us on Facebook um, with Blue Jam Art Space or you can go to our Instagram, which is at bluejamarts. Um, you can also find links for all our speakers there and they should be in the chat very soon. Um, so thank you everyone for viewing and thank you speakers. It's been wonderful. Bye. It's been a real... Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.